The seventh Tuesday, we talk about the fear of aging. Maury lost his battle. Someone was now wiping his behind. He faced this with typical, typically brave acceptance. No longer able to reach behind him when he used the commode, he informed Connie of his latest limitation. Would you be embarrassed to do it for me? She said no. I found it typical that he asked her first. It took some getting used to, Maury admitted, because it was, in a way, complete surrender to the disease. The most personal and basic things had now been taken from him. Going to the bathroom, wiping his nose, washing his private parts. With the exception of breathing and swallowing his food, he was dependent on others for nearly everything. I asked Maury how he managed to stay positive through that. Mitch, it's funny, he said. I'm an independent person, so my inclination was to fight all of this. Being helped from the car, having someone else dress me. I felt a little ashamed because our culture tells us we should be ashamed if we can't wipe our own behind. But then I figured, forget what the culture says. I have ignored the culture much of my life. I'm not going to be ashamed. What's the big deal? And you know what? The strangest thing. What's that? I began to enjoy my dependency. Now I enjoy when they turn me over on my side and rub cream on my behind so I don't get sores, or when they wipe my brow or they massage my legs. I revel in it. I close my eyes and soak it up, and it seems very familiar to me. It's like going back to being a child again. Someone to bathe you, someone to lift you, someone to wipe you. We all know how to be a child. It's inside all of us. For me, it's just remembering how to enjoy it. The truth is, when our mothers held us, rocked us, stroked our heads, none of us ever got enough of that. We all yearn in some way to return to those days when we were completely taken care of. Unconditional love, unconditional attention. Most of us didn't get enough. I know I didn't. I look at Maury and I suddenly knew why he so enjoyed my, learn my learn leaning over and adjusting his microphone or fussing with the pillows or wiping his eyes. Human touch. At 78, he was giving as an adult and taking as a child. Later that day, we talked about aging, or maybe I should say the fear of aging, another of the issues on my what's bugging my generation list. On my ride from the Boston airport, I had counted the billboards that featured young and beautiful people. There was a handsome young man in a cowboy hat smoking a cigarette, two beautiful young women smiling over a shampoo bottle, a sultry looking teenager with her jeans unsnapped and a sexy woman in a black velvet dress next to a man in a tuxedo, the two of them snuggling a glass of scotch. No, not once did I see anyone who would pass for over 35. I told Maury I was already feeling over the hill, much as I tried desperately to stay on top of it. I worked out constantly, watched what I ate, checked my hairline in the mirror. I had gone from being proud to say my age because of all I had done so young to not bringing it up for fear I was getting too close to 40 and therefore professional oblivion. Maury had aging in better perspective. All this emphasis on youth, I don't buy it, he said. Listen, I know what a misery being young can be, so don't tell me it's so great. All these kids who came to me with their struggles, their strife, their feelings of inadequacy, their sense that life was miserable, so bad they wanted to kill themselves. And in addition to all the miseries, the young are not wise. They have very little understanding about life. Who wants to live every day when you don't know what's going on? When people are manipulating you, telling you to buy this perfume and you'll be beautiful, or this pair of jeans and you'll be sexy, and you believe them. It's such nonsense. Weren't you ever afraid to grow old? I asked. Mitch, I embrace aging. Embrace it? It's very simple. As you grow, you learn more. If you stayed at 22, you'd always be as ignorant as you were at 22. Aging is not just decay, you know, it's growth. It's more than the negative that you're going to die. It's also the positive that you understand you're going to die and that you live a better life because of it. Yes, I said, but if aging were so valuable, why do people always say, oh, if I were young again, you never hear people say, I wish I were 65. He smiled. You know what that reflects? unsatisfied lives, unfulfilled lives, lives that haven't found meaning. Because if you've found meaning in your life, you don't want to go back. You want to go forward. You want to see more, do more. You can't wait until 65. Listen, you should know something. All younger people should know something. If you're always battling against getting older, you're always going to be unhappy because it will happen anyhow. And Mitch, he lowered his voice. The fact is, you are going to die eventually. I nodded. It won't matter what you tell yourself. 
I know, but hopefully, he said, not for a long, long time. He closed his eyes with a peaceful look, then asked me to adjust the pillows behind his head. His body needed constant adjustment to stay comfortable. It was propped in the chair with white pillows, yellow foam, and blue towels. At a quick glance, it seemed as if Maury were being packed for shipping. Thank you, he whispered as I moved the pillows. No problem, I said. Mitch, what are you thinking? I paused before answering. Okay, I said. I'm wondering how you don't envy younger, healthy people. Oh, I guess I do. He closed his eyes. I envy them being able to go to the health club or go for a swim or dance, mostly for dancing. But envy comes to me. I feel it and then I let it go. Remember what I said about detachment? Let it go. Tell yourself, that's envy. I'm going to separate it from it now and walk away. He coughed, a long, scratchy cough. And he pushed a, a tissue to his mouth and spit weakly into it. Sitting there, I felt so much stronger than he, ridiculously so, as if I could lift him and toss him over my shoulder like a sack of flour. I was embarrassed by this superiority because I did not feel superior to him in any other way. How do you keep from envying what? Me, he smiled. Mitch, it is impossible for the old not to envy the young, but the issue is to accept who you are and revel in that. This is your time to be in your 30s. I had my time to be in my 30s, and now is my time to be in my it to be 78. You have to find what's good and true and beautiful in your life as it is now. Looking back makes you competitive, and age is not a competitive issue. He exhaled and lowered his eyes as if to watch his breath scatter into the air. The truth is, part of me is every age. I'm a three-year-old, I'm a five-year-old, I'm a 37-year-old, I'm a 50-year-old. I've been through all of them and I know what it's like. I delight in being a child when it's appropriate to be a child. I delight in being a wise old man when it's appropriate to be a wise old man. Think of all I can be. I am every age up to my own. Do you understand? I nodded. How can I be envious of where you are when I've been there myself? Fate succumbs many a species. One alone jeopardizes itself. W.H. Auden, Maury's favorite poet. The eighth Tuesday, we talk about money. I held up the newspaper so that Maury could see it. I don't want my tombstone to read, I never owned a network. Maury laughed, then shook his head. The morning sun was coming through the window behind him, falling on the pink flowers of the hibiscus plant that sat on the sill. The quote was from Ted Turner, the billionaire media mogul, founder of CNN, who had been lamenting his inability to snatch up the CBS network in a, in a corporate mega deal. I had brought the story to Maury this morning because I wondered if Turner ever found himself in my old professor's position, his breath disappearing, his body turning to stone, his days being crossed off the calendar one by one. Would he really be crying over owning a network? It's all part of the same problem, Mitch, Maury said. We put our values in the wrong things and it leads to very disillusioned lives. I think we should talk about that. Maury was focused. There were good days and bad days now. He was having a good day. The night before, he had been entertained by a local a cappella group that had come to the house to perform, and he relayed the story excitedly, as if the ink spots themselves had dropped by for a visit. Maury's love for music was strong enough before he got sick, but now it was so intense it moved him to tears. He would listen to opera sometimes at night, closing his eyes, riding along with the magnificent voices as they dipped and soared. You should have heard this group last night, Mitch. Such a sound. Maury had always been taken with simple pleasures, singing, laughing, dancing. Now more than ever, material things held little or no significance. When people die, you always hear the expression, you can't take it with you. Maury seemed to know that a long time ago. We've got a form of brainwashing going on in our country, Maury sighed. Do you know how they brainwash people? They repeat something over and over. And that's what we do in this country. Owning things is good, more money is good, more property is good, more commercialism is good, more is good, more is good. We repeat it and have it repeated to us over and over until nobody bothers to even think otherwise. The average person is so bogged up by all this, he has no perspective on what's really important anymore. Wherever I went in my life, I met people wanting to gobble up something new, gobble up a new car, gobble up a new piece of property, gobble up the latest toy. And then they wanted to tell you about it. Guess what I got? Guess what I got? You know how I always interpreted that? 
the, these were people so hungry for love that they were accepting substitutes. They were embracing material things and expecting a sort of hug back, but it never works. You can't substitute material things for love or for gentleness or for tenderness or for a sense of camaraderie. Money is not a substitute for tenderness and power is not a substitute for tenderness. I can tell you as I'm sitting here dying, when you most need it, neither money nor power will give you the feeling you're looking for, no matter how much of them you have. I glanced around Maury's study. It was the same today as it had been the first day I arrived. The books held their same places on the shelves. The papers cluttered the same old desk. The outside rooms had not been improved or upgraded. In fact, Maury really hadn't bought anything new except medical equipment in a long, long time, maybe years. The day he learned that he was terminally ill was the day he lost interest in his purchasing power. So the TV was the same old model. The car that Charlotte drove was the same old model. The dishes and the silverware and the towels, all the same. And yet the house had changed so drastically. It had filled with love and teaching and communication. It had filled with friendship and family and honesty and tears. It had filled with colleagues and students and meditation teachers and therapists and nurses and acapella groups. It had become in a very real way a wealthy home, even though Maury's bank account was rapidly depleting. There's a big confusion in this country over what we want versus what we need, Maury said. You need food. You want a chocolate sundae. You have to be honest with yourself. You don't need the latest sports car. You don't need the biggest house. The truth is, you don't get satisfaction from those things. You know what really gives you satisfaction? What? Offering others what you have to give. You sound like a boy scout. I don't mean money, Mitch. I mean your time, your concern, your storytelling. It's not so hard. There's a senior center that opened near here. Dozens of elderly people come there every day. If you're a young man or young woman and you have a skill, you are asked to come and teach it. Say you know computers, you come there and teach them computers. You are very welcome there. And they are very grateful. This is how you start to get respect, by offering something that you have. There are plenty of places to do this. You don't need to have a big talent. There are lonely people in hospitals and shelters who only want some companionship. You play cards with a lonely older man and you find new respect for yourself because you are needed. Remember what I said about finding a meaningful life? I wrote it down, but now I, can't, I can recite it. Devote yourself to loving others. Devote yourself to your community around you and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. You notice, he added, grinning, there's nothing in there about a salary. I jotted some of the things Maury was saying on the yellow pad. I did this mostly because I didn't want him to see my eyes, to know what I was thinking, that I had been for much of my life since graduation pursuing these very things he had been railing against. Bigger toys, nicer house. Because I worked among rich and famous athletes, I convinced myself that my needs were realistic, my greed inconsequential compared to theirs. This was a smokescreen. Maury made that obvious. Mitch, if you're trying to show off for people at the top, forget it. They will look down at you anyhow. And if you're trying to show off for people at the bottom, forget it. They will only envy you. Status will get you nowhere. Only an open heart will allow you to float equally between everyone. He paused and looked at me. I'm dying, right? Yes. Why do you think it's so important for me to hear other people's problems? Don't I have enough pain and suffering of my own? Of course I do. But giving to other people is what makes me feel alive. Not my car or my house. Not what I look like in the mirror. When I give my time, when I can make someone smile after they were feeling sad, it's as close to healthy as I ever feel. Do the kinds of things that come from the heart. When you do, you won't be dissatisfied. You won't be envious. You won't be longing for somebody else's things. On the contrary, you'll be overwhelmed with what comes back. He coughed and reached for the small bell that lay on the chair. He had to poke a few times at it, and I finally picked it up and put it in his hand. Thank you, he whispered. He shook it weakly, trying to get Connie's attention. This Ted Turner guy, Maury said. He couldn't think of anything else for his tombstone. Each night when I go to sleep, I die. And the next morning when I wake up, I am reborn. Mahatma Gandhi.